Your monthly dose of astronomy news and views. This is Awesome Astronomy. Hello and welcome to episode 14 of Awesome Astronomy for August 2013 with me, your host, Paul. We have an exciting lineup of astronomy news and views, our five minute concept, a fantastic interview with Thierry Mon Merle of the IAU, and if that wasn't enough, we have questions and answers, the part of the show where you set the agenda. This is, of course, no Mercury mission, and playing the John Young to my Gus Grissom is Ralph. Hey! Great, that's Gemini, Apollo, and Space Shuttle, and yeah, head of he, the astronaut he, corps. He's got to be one of the most experienced astronauts <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah. So, Ralph, how did the July skies treat you? Yeah, pretty well. We've had some fantastic weather and we've got some great skies, as you were talking about in last month's episode mm. in the, the Sky Guide there. We've got these wonderful globular clusters overhead that are just astounding every time you look at them. And I've also been experimenting a little bit more with narrowband imaging in urban settings, so trying to take some deep sky images in cities where you've got light polluted skies with varying degrees of success. So uh, I'll keep plugging away at that. Mm. What about you, Paul? What, yeah, what have you been looking at this month? Well, I mean, it's been an embarrassment of riches in July. It really it? has, not it? We, we have had really beautiful clear skies for yeah. weeks yeah. we've had this heat wave and it's, it's not led to the best transparency mm-hmm. but it's been fantastic to have so many clear nights yeah it's been great yeah so i've been i've been glob hunting mainly i got a, got a bit addicted yeah actually, well this time of year there's just hunting. so many in the sky oh there? yeah yeah and it's just lovely to compare them and, and find them um especially especially by hand and not use the go-to and actually try and, yes. and try and seek them out and it's it's great when you discover one Going star hopping. So, what would you say is your favourite globular cluster? Oh, I usually like ninety-two. Actually, yeah. everyone, everyone goes for thirteen and says, yeah. "Oh, I'm for." Actually, I really like ninety-two and ten and twelve together. Yeah, really nice because you can get them in the same eyepiece. You get you can get them yeah with a nice wide field. You can get get them in the same same view. That's, yeah, uh, they're really nice. Yeah, if you hadn't have said ninety-two, I think I would have gone with that. So mm. uh, probably I would go for thirteen then. Yeah, well, I found I saw twenty-two actually the the, the infamous twenty-two mm-hmm. and it it is huge. Yeah, it's not one you see in the UK very much. It's yeah. very very low down. Um, I was I was out of London and managed to see it and it is massive. Yeah, and the great thing about all the globular clusters is because they're such big objects mm. with such big stars inside them that they're all around about the same magnitude between five and six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and twenty two is really bright as well. It's a really nice object to see, especially even low down in, in quite sort of that dusty, polluted part of the sky that you can never escape wherever you are. Yeah, and now we're past the solstice, we've got longer nights to look forward to, yeah. and it's warm while you're oh, out there. Yes. Well, so that was that was July. So um, I suppose it's time to look at August and what it has to offer in this month's Sky Guide. This is awesome astronomy. Okay, let's start with probably the highlight of summer astronomy, the Perseid meteor shower. Uh, There are many good showers through the year, but the combination of warm summer evenings, the length of the shower, and the potential zenithal rates that can approach 100 an hour make the Perseids unmissable. The peak of the shower occur between 6.45 and 8.45 universal time on the 12th of August, which for the UK is still in twilight, um, as sun is not going to set till about 8.45. But as darkness falls and the sky over the UK turns onto the debris stream of Comet Swift Tuttle, the shower should still be spectacular. The Perseids are a long shower, beginning on the 15th of July and not ending to the 25th of August, so the nights leading up to the peak and the nights after are well worth watching too. And the moon, still in its early phases, means the sky should be dark. Yeah, and the great thing about the peak lasting over two nights, it means that wherever you are in the Northern Hemisphere, even if the radiant in the constellation of Perseus is below the horizon, Mm. it still means you're going to get a great view of what are, are quite spectacular showers. So just wait until it's dark, and it's well worth going out and taking a look. Oh yeah, I mean the, the radiant is probably the last place actually you want to to stare at. Mm. You want to look around the radiant. Um, so if if it is below the horizon, you should still see a lot of the shower. And it's worth looking all night, any any time of the night that you're mm. out there. Yeah, and um, NASA did some work recently that showed that Perseids are actually the, uh, the the shower with the greatest number of fireballs. You should see, you know, hopefully big bright meteors. Um, yeah, and occasionally you actually get to see smoke trails as well oh, following yeah, behind yeah, them. Yeah, so definitely worth looking. Um, the best advice for viewing um, is to get a comfy seat, preferably something that reclines or a lounger. Find a spot with as much sky as possible. Any direction is good, though east and south might be a good place to start. The so-called radiant, the point of the sky where the meteors appear to originate from, moves from the area of sky between Cassiopeia and Andromeda, past the double cluster, into Perseus and Camelopardus. At the peak, the radiant sits between the last two constellations. 
The Perseids are famous for their high zenithal hourly rate, which is the number of meteors that, under ideal conditions, should be seen at the zenith. Realistically, we're probably looking at around 30 an hour, which is still a great sight, probably greater than most other showers, and worth spending a few hours enjoying on a warm summer's night. Yeah, how great is it that you're going to likely see two meteors every minute? Oh, exactly, yeah. Um, And in a really dark sky, you may well see more. Yeah, a lot more, and and they're going to be really bright too. Yeah. So, moving on to the planets, we are still in a position at the beginning of the month to see all seven planets, with views of Mars, Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune steadily improving through the month. Neptune reaches opposition on the 27th of August, and will offer the best views of that planet for this year. It will be low down in Aquarius, about two degrees west of the star Sigma Aquarii. This is a planet that, despite being over 15 times larger than Earth, even at its closest will be 4.3 billion kilometres away, and still a tiny object and will need binoculars or a telescope to be seen. Small scopes will see a small, dim, blue-grey disc, while larger scopes may well pick up the largest moon, Triton, which has a distinction in the solar system of being the only large moon with a retrograde orbit. So by retrograde, what you mean there is that the moon actually rotates in the different direction to the rotation of the planet itself, and that's quite a rarity, isn't it? Yeah, it is, um, especially for a large body. I mean, most of the planets orbit in the same direction as the sun spins and our moon orbits in the same direction that the earth rotates so it is very unusual it probably points to triton being a captured object yeah. not something that formed around neptune right we're well, moving on to uranus um it's following behind in the constellation of pisces and it still has a long way to go before it's best with opposition due at the beginning of october in a good sky uranus is a naked eye object though at present with summer skies and low altitude it'll need to be a very good sky to be seen Mars and Jupiter begin the month as they end in July, rising together before dawn in Gemini, and for the first part of the month they are followed by Mercury. With the sun rising just after 5am British summer time, 4am universal time, the observation period is still quite short for this conjunction, but views of both Jupiter and Mars improve through the month, though both will appear quite small as neither is near opposition. In fact, both planets don't reach opposition until 2014. Mercury will present a good size in the first few days of August, appearing 7 arc seconds, However, through the month it's moving back towards the Sun and reaches superior conjunction on the 24th. Venus is very apparent in the evening sky and continues to move away from the Sun. Currently it can be found in the constellation of Leo, but it is easy to find before any stars appear as it's sitting a few degrees above the sunset wherever you are in the Northern Hemisphere, blazing away at magnitude minus 3.8. It is presenting a broad phase as the month progresses, but Venus will not reach great heights this month, but will still be worth a look. Saturn, though, is on borrowed time in August, and it's soon going to be lost to the Sun's glare, though it doesn't officially reach solar conjunction, where it passes behind the Sun from Earth's perspective, until November. So this is a long goodbye, and fans of the ring world should grab their last views this month to see them through the Saturn-free autumn and early winter. This month's moon is well-timed for the Perseids, and should be out of the way for the best of the shower. We start the month with a 24-day-old moon, following full moon on the 22nd July, while new moon is reached on the 6th of August. Plenty to see on our satellite, and with the short light nights still tailing serious deep sky observing, it's still a good time to have a look at some of the fascinating objects the moon presents us. Look out for craters such as Copernicus around the 15th, Kepler around the 17th, and Aristarchus around the 17th and 18th. There are three good libration targets at the end of the month, with craters Scott, Wexler and Lyot visible on the 19th, 20th and 21st respectively. These are down on the limb of the southeast quadrant and appear due to a phenomenon of libration where, due to the moon's elliptical orbit, we get to see more than 50% of the moon's surface. Deep sky astronomy is still fighting its way out of the summer glare through August, but the nights are lengthening and the skies are getting darker. August has to be a good month for the summer triangle, an asterism made of three stars, Deneb in Cygnus, Vega in Lyra, and Altair in Aquila, and includes within it Valpicula and Sagitta. This is a rich part of the sky, with the Milky Way running through it, and there are some great targets to hunt down, with of course M57 the Ring Nebula, and M27 the Dumbbell Nebula being two of the best, along with NGC 7000 the North American Nebula. Also worth finding are globular clusters M56 and 71, as well as some of the overlooked open clusters like M39. And of course, the famous coloured double of Alberio is always worth a look. Ophicus is an often overlooked constellation, and one that in a polluted sky is easy to miss, sitting below Hercules and to the right of the Summer Triangle. It is home to a fantastic set of globular clusters. M10 and M12 can be seen in the same wide angle and picked up in binoculars, while M9, 14, 19 and 107 are scattered around waiting to be found. There is also a spectacular imaging target in the Roa Firekai complex, a beautiful patch of nebulosity on the southern edge of the constellation near Antares. So let's hope for the kind of skies we've had in July and do share any images, sketches or observations with us on our Facebook group. This is Awesome Astronomy. Okay, that's enough for me. Now it's over to Ralph for this month's news roundup. 
And I think this is a first for us. In the year and a bit that we've been doing these podcasts, I don't think we've ever had a month where we haven't had a big news story about either Mars or exoplanets. That's just outrageous. It is, isn't it? But this well, month we're going to... What's Curiosity up to? <laughs> well, that's probably why it's not doing a great it's, deal it's at the moment. It's broken, but... isn't it? <laughs> well, it's on its way to Mount Shot. No, I'm not going to talk about... <laughs> we're not going to talk about Mars. No, we're going to mention it. <laughs> we're going to banish these lines of inquiry in favour of intergalactic explosions and new bodies being found in our solar system for a change. And first up is the naming of two moons that were discovered around Pluto in 2011 and 2012. So since their discovery by Mark Showalter of the SETI Institute, they were referred to by their official designations P4 and P5. And as all moons in our solar system have to have more memorable names on Greek or Roman mythology in the main, we had to wait for a name to be assigned to these two distant ice blocks that will be adopted by the astronomy community. And this is done by the International Astronomical Union, or IAU. And as luck would have it, I'll be speaking with the General Secretary of the IAU later in the show. Oh, it's almost like we planned it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> without wanting to give anything away from the interview that's later on, the SETI Institute wanted to let the public give a memorable name to these two moons, and they proposed a range of names. Most of them were in line with the Greco-Roman naming tradition of Greek or Roman gods that looked like Gandalf, but in a bit of publicity seeking, or perhaps I'm being a bit unkind, and maybe it was just good fortune for SETI, William Shatner got involved, and he suggested Vulcan. Now, naturally, this gained popular support, a lot of public support, and Vulcan got more than 174,000 votes, more than any of the others, which included Styx, Persephone, Cerberus, and Acheron, all good-sounding names and all in line with the mythical underworld theme of Pluto being the ruler of the underworld. And the earlier discovered moons of Pluto had followed the underworld theme by being named Sharon, after the ferryman that carries souls across the river Styx to hell, Nyx, the goddess of the night and shadows, and Hydra, the guardian of the entrance to the underworld. But Vulcan was a no-go because it was the name given to a planet suspected in the 19th century to exist in an orbit closer to the sun than Mercury. And now Vulcanoids refers to any asteroids that are found within the orbit of Mercury. It also doesn't fit the Pluto underworld theme that helps astronomers and the public remember which moon belongs to which planet. So while Showalter and the SETI Institute had good intentions in putting it to a public vote, they really should have consulted the IAU first because the IAU don't want to take naming out of the public's hands, but they could have advised SETI as to what names were available or likely to be accepted by the world's astronomy community. So Vulcan, to the chagrin of 174,000 respondents and the original Captain Kirk, was thrown out, as was Cerberus, because that name's already been used by an asteroid, a feature on the surface of Mars, and a now disused constellation. But Vulcan aside, the most popular names in the poll, Cerberus and Styx, were granted, although Cerberus had to be amended to an alternative spelling of Kerberos, with a K, to not conflict with the asteroid, constellation, and Martian feature. And yay, we got Mars in yeah, again. Yeah, see, you get to him. So, Kerberos relates to the three-headed dog that guards the entrance to the underworld, and Styx is the river that hellbound souls must traverse on their way to the underworld. So we now have the Pluto system containing the mythologically apropos and officially recognised moons of Charon, Hydra, Nyx, Kerberos and Styx. And then when NASA's New Horizons spacecraft passes Pluto in 2005, it's going to be taking the best images we've ever seen, and it'll also take the chemical compositions of this icy dwarf planet and its largest moon, Charon. We also expect it to reveal more moons in the system and show conclusively that this system is icy debris from the Kuiper belt that was once briefly miscategorized as planets and planetary moons. That's if it doesn't hit any of them, because there is a real threat that it could hit one of these unseen moons. Yeah, and as it gets closer, uh. it, it's going to spot moons itself, and NASA are already having to take measures to mitigate the chance of it hitting any bodies mm. in the, the Pluto system, which really would be... Oh, that uh, would be gutting, wouldn't it? It would be so if it's disappointing. it's been such a long mission. Yeah. <laughs> But imagine what they're having to do with the Cassini spacecraft when you've got all those objects there. You've got the rings and you've got oh, the moons and trying yeah, to avoid things. I know there's a lot of space between them, but how much debris there must be in this mission phase currently with yeah. Cassini where it's actually examining the rings close mm -hmm. up. And the, the greater number of orbits, the greater number of chances of hitting something. Yeah, uh, yeah I wouldn't be in charge of that. So sticking with moons, it's not just Pluto. Uh, we're going to look at Neptune as well. Yeah, it's easy to think that we've already explored our solar system thoroughly enough that we shouldn't still have new moons popping up around our nearby planets. And even though the Voyager and Pioneer explorers made their way beyond the inner planets, the Hubble Space Telescope, which it's easy to forget, is only 350 miles away from the surface of the Earth. 
is still revealing moons around other bodies in our solar system. And we're all about moons this month because we've got another moon to add to the solar system, thanks to Mark Showalter once again. And Showalter found yet another faint and distant moon on the 15th of July 2013 by looking through Hubble data from the period between 2004 and 2009. And that was a 14th moon around the farthest planet from the Sun, Neptune. So until the only ever spacecraft encounter with Neptune in 1989, only three of its moons, Triton, Nereid and Larissa, had been discovered. And then the Voyager flyby revealed six more moons and further discoveries using ground-based telescopes and now Hubble imagery in the last decade of taking this tally up to 14 in total, so far. So Neptune's now thought to have 14 moons, and they're all in a very bizarre arrangement of varied inclinations, and as Paul suggested earlier on, even different directions of rotation, which lead us to think that many of these moons were once comets or asteroids that were captured by Neptune's gravity, or perhaps the debris from collisions between these bodies. And in the case of Neptune's largest moon, Triton, which is larger than Pluto and actually makes up more than 99% of the total mass of all the moons in the Neptunian system, we strongly suspect that this was once a dwarf planet in the Kuiper Belt that was captured by the gas giant long ago. So it's quite fitting that the moon Nereid, itself likely to be a body from the Kuiper Belt that forms a ring of icy debris beyond the orbit of Neptune, was discovered in 1949 by none other than Gerard Kuiper himself. But back to this 14th moon, Showalter was studying clumps of particles in Neptune's rings which zip around the planet and look blurry in Hubble telescope images, so he used a software technique to combat this motion, and looking further out from the planet he spotted a white dot which he calculated makes a full orbit every 23 hours, and this is more than 65,000 miles from Neptune in between the orbits of the moons Larissa and Proteus. And for now it takes on the name S2004N1 until the International Astronomical Union assigns an official designation of Mark Showalter's choice, one that will likely follow the Greco-Roman tradition of naming the ice giant's moons in the Neptune-Poseidon mythological tradition. But unfortunately, if you're hoping to spot it from your garden with a scope that's only 12 miles in diameter and at 26 magnitude and 2.5 billion miles away, it's 100 million times fainter than the dimmest star you can see on a clear, dark night with the naked eye. But Neptune's moon Triton is visible from Earth with a 12 or maybe a 14-inch yeah. scope, so it's worth taking a look um, to see if you can separate the planet or the moon from the planet if you've got a larger scope. Mm, yeah, I mean, that, that's a, I mean, you're seeing the furthest moon you can see from, from Earth. That, that's a great thing to do. Mm. So, next in the news, you've got a mystery for us to explore. Yes, and we do like a mystery on Awesome Astronomy, don't we? Oh, yeah. And this one involves the origin of mysterious radio signals that have been detected by the Parkes Observatory in New South Wales, Australia. And for a bit of trivia, the Parkes Observatory was used by NASA to relay the signals from the first moon landing by Neil Armstrong, which just celebrated its 44th anniversary last month on July the 20th. And the romanticised story of the observatory staff during this momentous event forms a subject for the charming film The Dish that came out in 2000. But back to the recent discoveries that the Parkes Observatory has been making. Early last month we heard news from Australia's National Science Agency in the July issue of the journal Science that the 64 metre radio dish has detected four brief flashes of radio emission from the distant universe. And this is similar to an oft-discredited detection of this kind that was seen in Parkes Observatory data from 2001. Is it aliens, Paul? Oh, I'd love it to be. It would be great, wouldn't it? But uh, it's, it's unlikely. This is going to be like little green men that some of pulsars. <laughs> I, I, I bet you this is this is going to be another pulsar style <laughs> labelled as little green men. Yeah, because we, we just don't know what they are. No. Like, like pulsars when they were detected, um, except say that they aren't aliens. They're thought to happen all over the sky, and actually they're estimated to happen once every 10 seconds somewhere in the sky, but they don't often get spotted. But we do know that the bursts last about a millionth of a second and don't have any accompanying X-ray or gamma rays that would signal gamma ray bursts, colliding neutron stars, or evaporating black holes. But we don't know what they are or what's causing them, and that's good. We love a puzzle. Mm. Now, because they didn't come from the direction of the plane of our galaxy, where there's the densest concentration of Milky Way stars... And because the time delay between the low and the high frequency components of the signals show that they've travelled great distances, we also believe they're extragalactic. And the distance sighted is around 5 billion light years for the nearest one and 10 billion for the more distant burst. So really spread out in all four dimensions. 
and and that's older than the sun. Yeah, in all cases, older than the sun. Now, as part of the square kilometre array that's being constructed, and that'll be the largest and most sensitive radio telescope array ever built, the Australian Pathfinder component will scan the whole sky specifically for these signals, and we can only hope that the more detections are made, the more clues to their source emerge. But the fact that they were detected in a region that covers 10% of the sky and each burst only occurred once shows that they're likely to be single violent explosions within galaxies that happen regularly across the sky. But as they all seem to be billions of light years away and we don't see them happening in nearby galaxies, they may be events that happened in the conditions of the universe's past and don't occur anymore. There may also be more mundane radio source detections misidentified by the Parks team, though both of these seem unlikely. So what we do suspect, though, is that the Square Kilometre Array, when it comes online around 2020, may tell us about another class of objects as surprising and as exciting as supernovas and pulsars were when they were first discovered. So what do we say about this when we don't know how to wrap it up or summarise it? Well, I'll borrow a line from Doctor Who. Time will tell, it always does. And the first person to tell us which Doctor said that by email, Facebook or Twitter will give a shout out to in the next month's show and you'll be awarded the Awesome Astronomy Nerd Badge. A greater badge of honour you'll be hard pressed to find. Oh yes. Okay, so back to our solar system and we're now looking at a picture of Saturn that the Cassini spacecraft took last week. And this is a really special picture because if you listened to last month's show, Paul told you about the opportunity for all of humanity to wave and say cheese for a truly remarkable photo. And we're looking at this now and it really is something really special. And that's all because on the evening of the 19th of July, the Cassini probe, which has been in orbit around Saturn since 2004 took a shot of the gas giant with the sun directly behind it. And as we look at it now, it means that the, the body of the planet's in shadow and the rings are just really beautifully illuminated. And, and, and that's it's not just a beautiful picture, it's also science in there because it allows the project scientists to actually look at the really small particles in the rings that they wouldn't ordinarily see if they weren't looking at the sun behind the rings. And hanging beneath the rings is the beautiful blue dot of the planet Earth, and as Carl Sagan said of a similar image taken by Voyager 1 in 1990, but much more eloquently than me, on that fragile looking dot is absolutely everything that matters to us. And when I stepped out of a pub in London on the night of the 19th of July and immediately looked up, as I do instinctively whenever I walk out of a building, I thought about Cassini and knew that at the moment that this image was taken I was enjoying a comedy act, but looking at this new NASA image, during the time it took to capture it, there will have been 40 people born, there will have been countless people celebrating their 18th birthdays and graduations, and 20 people will have died on that dot. Every person you've ever loved, ever known, ever heard of or read about, every mammal, bird, insect or dinosaur that ever lived, the first cell that spawned every life form we know of now, were all protected from the lethal conditions of space by that dot and the 50 miles of atmosphere around it. Yeah, thanks, Carl. And um, <laughs> taken from 900 million miles away, it looks just, it looks incredibly vulnerable and fragile. Yeah, it really does. This is awesome struggle. Well, before we go into this month's five-minute concept, we've got the small issue of the competition that we ran last month where we asked what was the subject of Paul's five-minute concept last month. And, of course, it was, it was globular, globular clusters. clusters. Yeah. Well, we've had entries from all over the world, haven't we? Um, yeah, we have. And uh, we've got a little tombola here. So let's let's pick someone out. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's go for it. So uh, we're, we're spinning, spinning, the, uh, spinning the tombola. Okay, it's just a cup. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are plenty of entries in it. Let's have a look. Um, drawing it out. And the winner of the binoculars is Brandon Mather. He's hey, 12 years old. Well done, Brandon. Well done. And what you're going to win there is a pair of wonderful Celestron Skymaster 15 by 70 binoculars. And since they're... Celestron, you know they're going to be ideal for astronomy. And with these, you're going to be able to pick out, well, they're certainly the brightest and the biggest of the galaxies. You'll oh, be yeah, able definitely. to see planets with mm -hmm. them. Oh, they'd be great for looking at the moon. And, and most of the objects you were discussing yeah. in your yeah. Yeah. Uh, sky guide earlier on. And also you'll be able to split Alberia with these, which is fantastic. And um, courtesy of the Tring Astronomy Centre, we're also going to throw in uh, planisphere as well, so that you'll be able to learn your way around the sky and uh, find the objects that you want to take a look at. So congratulations, Brandon, and I hope they uh, they give you many years of good service looking at the sky. And now this month's Five Minute Concept, which comes at the request of Ollie Brody via our Facebook group, who was asking what variable stars are. 
The demon star Algol represents the severed head of the Gorgon Medusa, slain by the hero Perseus, and now about to be used to turn Cetus to stone so nearby Princess Andromeda can be rescued. It is a noticeable Mag 2.4 star, and the second brightest in the constellation, except every two days, 20 hours and 49 minutes, when it dims for 10 hours to magnitude 3.4, and becomes the eighth brightest in Perseus. This variability was not officially recorded until 1667 by Geminiano Montanari, but anecdotally the name Demon Star, as well as an ancient Egyptian calendar of luck that times periods of bad luck every 2.85 days, suggests that the dimming of Algol is a long-time observation. Why Algol should do this was first suggested in 1783 by John Goodrick, who suggested that Algol was being eclipsed by an orbiting body that passed between the star and Earth. Proof of this suggestion had to wait until 1881, when it was discovered that Algol wasn't just a binary, but was in fact a triple star system. This appeared to be the mechanism that explained the periodic dimming of some stars. Some dimming was irregular, some was unpredictable, while some became so much brighter or dimmer that it could be explained by this simple eclipse theory. It would take until the 20th century in the work of, amongst others, Eddington, Hoyle and Gamo to explain the mechanism of star shine and the process of stellar evolution. As more detail of the life of stars emerged, it became apparent that variables fell into two broad categories. First, there was the already established extrinsic variables, such as the eclipsing binaries. Add to this was now intrinsic variables, where some quality of the star itself changes the energy output of the star. As we've understood more and gathered more data, the numbers and type of these intrinsic variables has increased. Some are stars at the beginning of their lives, such as Tautori stars, a young pre-main sequence star sending out a burst of energy and stellar wind that clears the dust clouds surrounding it. As an aside, it is thought that the Tautori phase of some stars is a key limit on the size of planets. Other intrinsic variables are stars at the other extreme of life and represent giant stars in the throes of instability. The stars of exhausted core hydrogen are struggling with changes in temperature, pressure and different phases of nuclear synthesis. Stars such as Cepheids are yellow giants that have a great use in astronomy and became a key part of the story of cosmology. Cepheids have such a regular and predictable luminosity and pulsation, and a close and well-defined relationship between those two things, that a certain period of pulsation equates to a particular luminosity of Cepheid, that this star has become a standard candle. This means that Cepheids can be used to measure distances, as the observed pulsation tells us how bright the star actually is, and then this can be compared to the observed brightness and the distance calculated. The brightness of stars being related to distance in an inverse law of proportion, double the distance and you get quarter of the light. The predictable pulsations allow a positive identification of Cepheids, whereas another star may be dimmer because it is further away or because it is closer and is just not a very luminous star. The use of Cepheids to measure distance was pioneered by Henrietta Leavitt at Harvard, and it was this technique that allowed Hubble to measure the distance to M31 and show that it was a separate galaxy and ultimately lead to the theory of Big Bang. Levitt is rarely given the credit for the key work that formed the basis of modern cosmology. So how many stars are variable? We know of over 46,000 variables in the Milky Way, and over 10,000 in other galaxies, and of course, all stars including our Sun demonstrate a variation in energy output, but it's a difference of 0.1% over its 11-year cycle. Compared to Algol, the Sun is a paragon of consistency. And we're so lucky that these Cepheid variables exist so that we can use them as those standard candles to actually measure distances in the, in, uh, across the universe. Oh, yeah. I mean, it would be much harder to measure the kind of distances out to even just Andromeda if we didn't have this standard candle where you, you can measure the pulsation and go, right, we know how bright that star is, so therefore we can know how far away it is. And how impressive is it that Edwin Hubble back in the 1920s could actually see these stars in other galaxies? Yeah, he did have a 100-inch hooker. <laughs> yeah, he did, yeah. <laughs> For people that aren't aware, the hooker's a very famous telescope. This is Awesome Astronomy. Okay, it's time for this month's interview, and Ralph has been fortunate enough to talk to Thierry Montmerle, who is General Secretary of the International Astronomical Union, a body that many of you have heard of, but may not realise how important they are in the astronomy we all do. Let's join Ralph as they talk astronomy, education, international cooperation, what is a planet, and dear old Pluto. Well, joining us this month on Awesome Astronomy is Thierry Montmel, a professor at the Paris Institute of Astrophysics, author of and contributor to textbooks on the subjects of astrobiology, star clusters, and the life and death of stars, and the General Secretary of the International Astronomical Union. Hi Thierry, and welcome to Awesome Astronomy. Hi Ralph, good to speak to you today. Thank you. And uh, firstly, congratulations on renewing the International Astronomical Union's Memorandum of Understanding with the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. That's a very important and very fruitful effort, which is uh, 
quite something special. But eventually, the, uh, the memorandum of understanding was renewed, and it was very successful, and we were very happy on both sides. So can you tell me what this aims to achieve, and what can you tell me about astronomy heritage itself? Yes, uh, the idea is that uh, there is a lot to be done in terms of heritage for astronomy. So now uh, UNESCO is embarked on a more ambitious program, which is really considering science as a part of the world culture. And I think this is an extraordinary approach. And of course, uh, this means that scientific artifacts are part of our heritage. And it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, old observatories or old monuments. They, also, they already include modern uh, places. Of course, they have, these places have to have a history. And then they also have, uh, must have contributed in a sort of excellent and unique way to the history of astronomy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the memorandum of, of understanding, uh, what it states really is that there, there, there is and there will be an enhanced cooperation between UNESCO and IAU, and IAU acting as an expert to nominate astronomical sites that are really worth being part of the World Heritage and Astronomy because they have contributed so much to astronomy. And of course, UNESCO needs experts and the IU is providing this expertise. Well, best of luck with that. And as the International Astronomical Union is the preeminent body for promoting and safeguarding the science of astronomy, perhaps I should go back to basics and ask you to tell us what the IAU is and how it works. Yes, Ralph. So, uh, so to be short, uh, first, the, a, a few numbers. The IU has almost 11,000 members. They are all uh, professional astronomers. They are spread all over the globe because they're now the list of countries uh, contributing to the IU via Jews is 73, I think, to be exact. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you may uh, uh, imagine, this ranges all the way from the developed countries like Europe, the US, Japan, etc., uh, all the way to less privileged countries. And to give you an example, the last three countries that uh, were admitted to the IU were Ethiopia, Mongolia, and North Korea. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's a, a main task of the uh, of the IU. I would say would be to be the international union for astronomers, for people doing astronomy, and that, I think that's one of its major missions. So the leading mission would be to gather all the astronomers together. But then there are other missions which the IU considers as very important, and namely outreach and education. The IU is engaged in high profile actions uh, in education and outreach. And to give you an example, the IU has created, I, I think it was just two years ago, an Office of Astronomy for Development. Uh, as the name implies, it's, uh, it's basically a place where uh, projects will be uh, submitted and approved. Mm -hmm. So this office has been established in South Africa, in Cape Town, and is working well and is picking up quite rapidly. And this, uh, this is just one of the most visible actions that the IU has. But it also has actions like, uh, like uh, young astronomer schools, like, uh, you know, uh, two week uh, uh, courses for Latin America, for Asia, etc, etc. Mm -hmm. So I would say that being an association of professional astronomers is one thing, and then being uh, actively engaged in outreach and education is also the, the, the other side, uh, the other bright side, I would say, of the IU. Essentially, all the world's astronomers are rep being represented in the IU. Well, I think most non-astronomers will probably know the IAU best as the organization that assigns names or nomenclature to um, astronomical objects. So would it be possible to go through a few celestial objects one by one and find out what the official nomenclature is and how it was decided upon? Uh, yes, we can, although I'm not a big expert on nomenclature. <laughs> but, <laughs> but with recent events, I got to be more knowledgeable about this issue. But go ahead. I'll, I'll tell you whether I can answer or not. So moving on to planets within our own solar system, can you tell us what defines a planet now? So um, ah, the planet definition. There was a definition of planets that was adopted at the Prague IU General Assembly in 2006, and that was because of the famous issue about Pluto. I'll come on to that in a moment. Yes. <laughs> so the, the, actually, to be, to be honest, and this is a personal view, not the official view of the IU, I think defining a planet is... It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult because uh, it, I would say it's just like defining life. What is life? Nobody has been able to come up with a clear definition. 
we just know what is not life. And I would say we, we know when a celestial body is not a planet. And usually it's, it, can, it, it is the alternative is it being a star. It's hard to define something by what it's not, though, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so the official IU definition, uh, which is that the, the body must have cleared uh, its original disk by gravitational interaction and whatever, is a bit intricate and it's not very easy to understand by the public. And to be honest, it does not really satisfy everyone within the community. But I think it just illustrates the fact that it's very difficult to come up with a, um, a good definition that would find, that would uh, satisfy everyone. And um, that reclassification of Pluto that you mentioned a moment ago as a dwarf planet in 2006, it caused quite a, a sentimental reaction for some, which I think still persists to this day. But it was necessary, wasn't it? Oh yes, it was very necessary, and now uh, it was a, it completely justified when you see that uh, that now there's a whole new population of of planets called the dwarf planets beyond the 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 orbit of Neptune, basically. Mm -hmm. But you know, one of the reasons I think that's I, I got many questions about this, and I say, well, you know, instead of of being sad and saying, well, you know, Pluto has been demoted as a planet. I think this is this is absolutely unfair for astronomers. Pluto is the prototype of a new population of planetary bodies. And I think we should view this in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. We've been around with Pluto, and Pluto was a sort of telltale sign that there was a new population of planets beyond Neptune. And we did not recognize this for a long time. But take only the orbit of Pluto. The orbit of Pluto is, is deeply inclined with respect to the, uh, the orbit of the other planets. And clearly there was something wrong, if you will, with, with Pluto. And also, when, this is something which people tend to overlook, is that the estimates of the mass of Pluto, the, you know, the, the, the initial mass of Pluto when it was calculated was fairly large. It was like, uh, you know, the moon or something like that. It was quite, quite large and, and massive. But as time was born, as they, they, they were refinement in the observations of the orbits, and Pluto actually uh, got smaller and smaller and less and less massive to the point that it's just, uh, well, it is a dwarf planet. It really is. I mean, when you see the, its size and mass. And, but now we have, we have found other, other similar bodies like Aries and, and, uh, and many, many others. And they are thought to be just the remnants of the formation of the solar system. So the, the present status of Pluto is really justified. It's a, the prototype of a new class of planetary objects to which the, 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 the other planets, including the, the big giants like Jupiter, Saturn and Neptune, are clearly different. And Pluto is, is distinct. So this decision was scientifically sound. I mean, there's no, no question about that. And, uh, and also it, it has moons as well. It has satellites and two more were recently discovered around Pluto. So it must have been quite interesting to let the, um, the public give naming rights for the fourth and fifth moons in the Pluto system, was it? Yes, uh, that was an interesting idea. Well, actually, uh, you know, uh, here again, people may not realize this, but the public has been naming minor uh, bodies of the solar system for decades. There's a well-established procedure within the IU if you want to name an asteroid by your name, for instance, if you if you somebody wanted to have an asteroid's name after Ralph Wilkins, then there's a procedure for that. And there's a committee that will examine the reasons. And I'm sure there would be good reasons. You'll have to tell me the way to do that. That's, um, we'll, we'll do a petition on the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, so it's quite possible. So this is not new. Now, the difference is with recent cases is that a body external to the IU has sent the idea that the public directly should be involved. And that is what created the, the, some kind of problems. And unfortunately, uh, there were uh, the, the SETI organization started its process, which was interesting. I mean, proposing a list of 10 or 12 names to the public and say, you will vote and then we will recommend this name to the IU, which they clearly stated from the start that the IU would be would have the last word on this. So that was very clear. Unfortunately, uh, what SETI did not do was to consult the IU before launching. Uh, had SETI submitted the list of names to the IU, immediately the, uh, the IU would have excluded uh, at least two names from the list, namely Vulcan and Cerberus. Uh, this is where some problems started to be created because there was a kind of conflict between the votes and the IU uh, decision. And uh, so that was sort of unfortunate and we should correct this in the future. And we're working on some process that will allow 
an external organization to propose names for, for planets, uh, exoplanets or planetary satellites. But we, we say basically that if they want to, the, the name to be ultimately approved, they should collaborate with the IU from the start. And also, I must add, that something that the, the public tend to perhaps not know about or underestimate is the, the matter of intellectual property. Not all the names are public. And for instance, if you take Vulcan, which was, uh, of course, uh, that generated a lot of, uh, of controversy, and we uh, at the IU even received insulting messages, which I think is really uh, not worth of uh, real astronomers, mm -hmm. amateur astronomers, uh, Vulcan, as it is, of course, is taken by everyone to be the, the host planet of Mr. Spock. Mm -hmm. But, but I mean, first, it's a rock of 20 kilometers about in size, which is very, uh, you know, <laughs> Mr. Spock would not have liked that. <laughs> but, but more than that, I think Vulcan is perhaps a, 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 a name with a copyright. I mean, it's, I'm not sure it even can be used publicly. And so these names cannot be used uh, irresponsibly. And the names that the IU would give would be valid for centuries to come. So you cannot afford to, to endorse a name that is, cannot be available for public use. So what do we have now as the official names of the moons of Pluto? So the names of Pluto are, uh, so there was a negotiation between SETI and the IU. So the, uh, the SETI proposed Cerberus, which was already assigned to an asteroid. And then uh, the IU proposed to, to change it. Cerberus is Latin, and they proposed to have it named Kerberos, which is the uh, the Greek name. You know, the, the Cerberus is the, the name of the the hound dogs that that were in the in the hell in the Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. And then the second closest was Styx. Styx is both the name of a goddess and, and the river, which uh, separates the living world from hell. And so this is in line with the rules established by the IU, which is known to everyone, that the, uh, that the satellites of, of Pluto should be drawn from Greek mythology. Yeah. And of course, Vulcan did not satisfy this, uh, this condition either. So there's a, there's a lot of justification. But if in the future... Uh, some organization wants to do the same, then the message is that it absolutely should contact the IU before launching anything. So just saying, please, IU, we're going to launch a, a process for voting. Uh, can you help us? You are the experts. Can you tell us whether we can use the names or not? Which, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. And then they you say, okay, because anyone is allowed to give names to celestial objects. After all, why not? The IU is not the owner of the sky or the universe. However, if we want this name to be recognized worldwide by every nation, by every astronomer, by every person, then you, you should work with the IU, that's all. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's, it's your interest in, in a way. And Thierry, how likely is it that the asteroid series may require a reclassification as a full planet when the Dawn spacecraft reaches it in 2015? Uh, but Ferris is uh, has uh, seems to have an orbit which is quite in line with uh, you know the other uh, the other uh, planets and so so <laughs> it might be called a dwarf planet because it would be a planet I mean Ceres was the first uh, asteroid to be discovered uh, you know in the 19th century and it would be a dwarf planet but not in the sense that Pluto is a dwarf planet Pluto is really a different population mm -hmm. and, uh, than, the, than the others and I think Ceres I, I would tend to call it perhaps a small planet perhaps but mm -hmm. it's a, but it's a really big asteroid. It's sitting in the asteroid belt, you know, where the, the origin is not totally clear. But uh, you have to, to recall that the solar system is very complex. It, does, it has not only these uh, terrestrial planets and gas giant planets, it also has this asteroid belt, belt between Mars and Jupiter. And, and Ceres and Vesta and all these big asteroids are just big asteroids, uh, I, I would say. So perhaps this will change. I mean, science will tell. But uh, for the moment, uh, Cyrus is just barely spherical. It's just at the, at, the, at the edge of being a planet. Had it been more massive, perhaps it would have been a full-size planet, terrestrial planet. But it's in the very complex dynamical environments with many, many uh, uh, asteroids. And it's, uh, it really tells us a lot about the formation of the solar system and why there were not big planets in this, uh, in this asteroid belt. So moving on to objects that still require an official naming system, now that we have more than 900 confirmed exoplanets with probably many more on the way, what's the IAU going to do to create formal designations for those? Ah, that's a big issue. You know, it's just like for stars. 
uh, my colleagues that are doing this work are sort of struggling with history and with, with the rapid pace at which the exoplanets were discovered. I mean, we're thinking, you mentioned 900 characterized, but then we know that there will be a few more thousand very soon. The, it just takes patience to identify them one by one and characterize them as, for instance, real exoplanets, even massive and not brown dwarf. And there's the limit between very massive planets and brown dwarf is very, is very fuzzy. So it may well be that some of the objects that are called exoplanets or candidate exoplanets are actually very, very small brown dwarfs. Okay, so that's an issue and that people are working on that. Okay, well, this, this leads naturally onto the murky world of naming objects because despite official naming of planetary and lunar features and stars and galaxies by the IAU, there's also a lot of money being made by companies that offer to let the public name these objects too. And where does this stand in terms of legitimacy? Oh, well, this is very clear. If you go to the IAU site, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, on the homepage, it's very clear. You have a, a beautiful image and that, that is entitled... Uh, you know, buying star names. And it explains everything. And it certainly explains in particular that all these uh, these uh, actions, while not unlawful, I mean, the IU is not providing any law uh, forbidding anyone to sell planet uh, star names, but we just say, be careful. The names that these people are going to sell you are not legitimate names. They are not names recognized by the IU. If you're happy with that and you're happy to pay $20 to have your favorite star uh, called uh, after your grandfather, that's fine. But just be conscious that this is not approved by the IU and this is just people making uh, money out of your credulity yeah. and that you, you probably shouldn't do it. And what about companies like Owingu that have respected astronomers involved but are still offering, say, exoplanet naming rights for a fee? Well, we again, we don't approve that. Uh, we just say that the names they come up with, which I think is rather pathetic in the end, if you look at the results, is will not be recognized by the IU. So it's a kind of trade-off. Either you collaborate with the IU from the start, and then the IU is going to help you, providing its expertise, like a legitimacy of the names, and then rights to use them, etc. And then the process has to be free and has to be accessible by all the people around the world. So in all these cases, you can pay money to name an object, but it won't be official? Yes, absolutely. Mm. Well, finally, as an eminent astrophysicist, if there was just one discovery in all of astronomy or astrophysics that you could make tomorrow, what would it be? Well, this, uh, I think for me, the greatest discovery would really be the discovery of an exoplanet with, uh, with evidence of life. It, it would involve, of course, astronomers, but all kinds of, of field of science. So not only would it be philosophically important for humanity, but it would be very important scientifically in bringing many people that many of whom are already working together, but even more people working together. To me, that would be by far the, the greatest discovery in all of history of mankind, actually. If, you, if we had a proof, then, you know, it would be uh, something absolutely fantastic. We'll have to be patient. It may come in 20 years, it may come in 100, but it's, uh, it's a challenge that really humanity as a whole should take up. And that's the perfect place to end the interview. Well, it's been fascinating to get the official line on everything beyond the atmosphere. So Thierry Montmel, thank you for taking the time to speak with us on Awesome Astronomy this month. Thank you for asking. It's, it's been a pleasure. This is Awesome Astronomy. OK, it's time for questions and answers, the part of the show where you set the agenda. And our first question comes in from a Daily Mail via their own website. <laughs> and they ask, did the full moon send Kate Middleton into labour? Well, this is an interesting question, Daily Mail, and we're happy here at Awesome Astronomy to give you an answer. No. No. <laughs> yeah. um, there are several aspects to this answer, which we could ask a high school physics student about, but we will then to answer ourselves in lieu of a 16-year-old. First of all, full moon has nothing whatsoever to do with how close the moon is or how strong its gravitational pull is. A full moon is purely a result of the angle of the sun's light illuminating the moon's surface as seen from Earth. Full moon occurred in July on the 22nd at 16 minutes past 6 Universal Time or 16 minutes past 7 British Summer Time. Now, purely on a chronological point, little Prince George was born at 24 minutes past 3 Universal Time, 24 minutes past 4 British Summer Time, so almost three hours before full moon occurred. And of course, the onset of labour was many hours before this. But let's get a little bit more scientific. Now, if you ignore the full moon and talk about apogee, the point where the moon is nearest the Earth, 
on its elliptical orbit. Then this occurred in July on the 23rd at 1100 UT or 12 o'clock midday BST. This of course was the day after the birth. So purely on the premise that a bright close moon induced labour, we can see that the moon was neither full nor at its closest at the appropriate time. But there was a moon in the sky as it always is, so did it have any effect anyway? Um, the moon, after all, is the major cause of the tides, where the moon's gravity interacts with the water, and of course, the human body is mainly water, and in the case of a woman's pregnant belly with all that fluid, etc, etc, well, it's obvious, isn't it? No, it isn't. Um, you can work out the effect the moon's gravity has on the Earth's surface using some simple Newtonian maths. Uh, it's been around for a few hundred years, and the result you should get is about 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7 g. Now, bearing in mind that we talk about Earth's gravity as being 1g, we can see the result for the Moon we get is a result that is over a 9 millionth of the effect. <laughs> now, just think about what a 9 millionth looks like. 9 millionth of a kilogram or pound, 9 millionth of a kilometre or a mile. It's a tiny, tiny little effect. Ah, but I hear you cry. What about the oceans? What about the oceans? What about the oceans? Exactly. Well, the oceans are massive. Um, in fact, they have a mass of 1.4 times 10 to the 21 kilograms. Uh, which compares to 7.3 times 10 to the 22 kilograms for the mass of the Moon. Both are massive objects, which, if you consider the basics of Newtonian gravity, will have an effect on each other. Uh, the Moon raises in height the mass of the oceans, and the oceans have a breaking effect on the Moon's rotation, for example. Now, in theory, yes, all objects have an effect on all others, gravitationally, but it is in proportion to mass and distance. And while I'm sure the Duchess of Cambridge had a sizable pregnancy belly as she came to full term, I'm pretty sure it's bordering on treasonable to compare it and the future King George VII it contained to the mass of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> but what really surprises me about this story is that it clearly violates the prime directive of Daily Mail reporting that any article's subject must either cause cancer or lead to a net increase in immigration. <laughs> Indeed. Um, I mean, there's also they've talked about the, the anecdotal evidence from midwives um, saying that mm. the uh, nights of a full moon are, are usually busy on yeah. labour wards. Now... To a certain degree, without wanting to sort of disparage midwives, most people aren't aware of when a full moon actually occurs, mm. and probably even report a full moon occurring a day, a day or so or e yeah. each side. So actually, if you think about, you know, we'll be generous and say a day each side, a full moon, people think is a full moon as well, that's three days, that's 10% of a month. Yeah. So, you know, it's likely that a busy day is going to occur at some point around there. And you've got the confirmation bias in there as well, exactly. where people are going to be are going to remember the births that happen around that period, exactly. but they'll forget the ones that don't happen. Yeah, there's so. going to be plenty of busy nights where there's no full moon, but it just won't yeah won't rem be remembered exactly. Um, so there you are, Daily Mail. Um, in answer to your question, did the full moon induce the uh, Kate Middleton's birth? No, no, it didn't. No. Okay, our next question comes from two different people. We have Lisa Mather in Lancashire via the Facebook group who asks, how likely is it Beetlejuice, Beetlegeese, <laughs> Betel, Betelgeuse? What are we gonna, what are we gonna call it this month? Well, um, I'm gonna call it Betelgeuse because that's what Thierry of the uh, IAU yeah, called okay, it. Well, that's, that's good enough yeah, for yeah. us. Um, well, will it go supernova in our lifetime? And also, do you believe there is a supermassive black hole in the centre of our galaxy? Mm. Um, this was also asked by Damien Phillips, who says, what are the brightness predictions if Betelgeuse <laughs> yeah. goes supernova in our lifetime? And that was via Twitter. Okay, well, I'll answer the supermassive black hole question first and say that we've got to look at the evidence. Um, if you go back to episode six of Awesome Astronomy, we spoke with Professor Sandy Faber, who showed through her research that most galaxies have a supermassive black hole in their centre. And by supermassive, we mean millions or billions of times heavier than our sun. And as we look towards our galactic centre in the heart of the Sagittarius constellation, we see stars whipping around a concentrated mass in the region of 4 million times the mass of our sun. And we can't see this mass. And this fits the model that we see in most of the other galaxies out there that have supermassive black holes in their centre. So, unless something crazy like a concentrated mass of dark matter is sitting in the centre of the Milky Way, the evidence strongly points to a 4 million solar mass black hole sitting there. An interesting note is that in a few months' time towards the end of 2013, a gas cloud, or maybe it's part of the atmosphere from a star, we just can't tell yet, is due to get very close to this central mass. And when it does, we should get a much better understanding of what's lurking there in the centre of our galaxy, its mass and its exact position. And I suspect we'll be including that in a future Awesome Astronomy news section. Yeah, undoubtedly. So, moving on to Betelgeuse. Um, will it go pop in our lifetime, and how bright will it be? Well, put simply, no, 
and we don't know. But I'll go into more detail there. So, Betelgeuse, or Alpha Orionis, is that beautiful orangey-red star in the left shoulder of Orion. It's a red supergiant because it's running out of fuel, and that's causing its atmosphere to bloat. Now, if it was in our solar system, it had filled the orbit of Jupiter, and because it's much more massive than our own sun, somewhere between 10 and 30 times more massive, it will go supernova and violently explode. Now, the bloating that it's already demonstrated is the precursor to this supernova, and we know its life is almost over. And when it does explode in a supernova, it should leave behind a neutron star and then a beautiful supernova remnant nebula for future astronomers to marvel at. But as its mass isn't even close to being pinned down, we can't be certain how bright the supernova will be or whether its end state will actually be a neutron star or it might even be a black hole. What we do expect, though, is for this beautiful but doomed star to explode in a supernova in the next million years, which, given that our sun has been burning for four and a half billion years, isn't that long in solar lifetimes. But for humans that live 70 to 80 years on average, it doesn't bode well for us getting to see it. More optimistic predictions, however, suggest that it may go pop sometime in the next 100,000 years. But even so, the chances of it happening in the next 50 years for our benefit are still very slim. Though, in a few thousand years, it's likely to pass into a wall of interstellar gas that'll accrete more matter onto the star, and that could speed up its demise. Again, a few thousand years is going to be no good for us, though. As for the brightness, as I said, uncertainties in the mass of the star and even its distance mean that it's difficult to calculate with any certainty, but the safest estimates suggest that it'll be somewhere between magnitude minus 8 and minus 11. So not as bright as the full moon, even if it does achieve its possible brightest, and certainly not like two suns in the sky. But even at its dimmest, it will still far outshine anything in the sky except the moon, being much brighter than the very impressive magnitude minus 4 Venus. So it would still be an extraordinary sight, but the supernova is only going to be visible for perhaps a month, and the peak brightness lasting for several hours or so. And then we're left with the Orion constellation without Betelgeuse forever. And what do you think on that, Paul? Would you lose Betelgeuse forever just to be able to witness that brief and bright supernova? Oh, I'm torn on that because it'd be great to see a supernova. Yes, I mean, it's such a tough one, isn't it? it? But it's iconic, Orion. I mean, mm. Orion without its left shoulder yeah. would be... It's not Orion. It's not Orion, exactly. You just wouldn't look the same. It needs that box around it, doesn't it? Does. It? it does, it does. This is Awesome Astronomy. Well, that's just about all for this month, so congratulations to Brandon, who's got those excellent binoculars winging their way over. And if you're coming along to Astro Camp in Wales in September, we now have the BBC Sky at Night cameras joining us, and you'll get the opportunity to put your astronomy questions to Lucy Green and Chris North in a space surgery Q&A session. You can get more news from us and send us questions for our Q&A section by joining our Facebook group or by Twitter at Orstrom Astro Pod. So until next month, enjoy those wonderful summer skies, and it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins and Paul Hill and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Soulsman. For more information about this podcast, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group and you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us via Facebook, Twitter, or by email at awesomeastropod at gmail.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. Neptune reaches opposition on the 26th of... 26th? 26th? 26th. Star Wars reference. <laughs>